Hello, welcome to my little trip down road testing memory lane Q&A video today. Um, but first of all, I want to say thanks very much for everyone uh, watching the Booster video and all your kind comments. What a bike that is. And thanks very much for all the um, new subscribers. Welcome aboard. Um, I'm on my travels. This week I have been in Vallelunga circuit in Rome, testing the new Ducati Panigale V4S. Now there's an embargo on the, the story, so uh, I can't say anything about the bike. If you're watching this uh, on Monday morning, uh, you'll be pleased to know the embargo's lifted at three o'clock UK time. So you'll be able to read all about it in MCN, online and YouTube video. If you're watching after then, then just um, go and click on it all. Um, all I can say is that it's very different to before. It might look quite similar, but it's, I mean, apart from the engine, it's pretty much all new. Um, it's got a few sort of standout points. Um, the new bits, the double-sided swing arm, obviously. A lot more flex in the swing arm, a lot more flex in the frame. Um, a lot more advanced electronics. All the rider aids um, have been refined thanks to this new system that they've developed that kind of creates a virtual kind of map of where the bike is in space and all the forces being acted upon it and that lets the rider aids um, be more refined um, also got a, a rear trail braking device whereby when you brake with the front the rear trail brakes into the corner <coughs> by itself even when the front's um, let off so find out what that's about as well um, and it was quite an exclusive launch uh, only 20 journalists from all over the world got to ride the bike 10 on day one 10 on day two um, and because there was only 10 of us on one day we had our own Ducati technician um, looking at all our data for us so whereas manufacturers normally tell you to take it steady on their bikes they were actively encouraging us to try and push this bike to you know as far as we could put it push it just as you know taste its fruits really um and my data guy was a chap that normally works with the the test team alessandro valia so he went through all my data basically telling me uh, where i was going slow which was most of the lap <laughs> um so yeah check that out soon and i'm in malaysia now went from rome to malaysia in uh, kuala lumpur um, Sepang circuit we're going to be riding some TVS bikes now most of us probably wouldn't have heard of TVS but they're an Indian manufacturer they make small capacity um, bikes sports bikes naked bikes all sorts they make bikes under license for other manufacturers like BMW with their G310R um, and they own Norton as well so we're going to be riding one of their one mate championship bikes around Sepang. Um, this is there's a series for young up and coming riders. They're three hundreds um, sports bikes, all the same. So we're going to be riding um, one of those in the evening around Sepang, which will be good fun. Um, so without further ado, let's do some questions, shall we? Right. First one is from. Uh, 1103 Trevor P on oh, easy. I know electronics are on nearly every new bike in some way or another, but as an owner of a lovely 2010 non ABS HRC blade, and with your recent acquisition being a GSXR 750 in mind, my question is Are there any bikes in recent times that have electronics but have um, truly analog feel to them? As I recently had a test ride on an M1000R, I felt a bit underwhelmed. Unlike the rest of the guys at the Motorrad, Motorrad day, they thought it was amazing. I don't know if I just don't get it or if there's something wrong with me, but the BMW just feels synthetic. The throttle tube feels way too light with no real direct connection and the brakes have outstanding power, but I couldn't feel the pads um, biting the discs. And also the acceleration wasn't as direct and lacked the fizz of the blade, but it was strong. I don't know if this is down to refinement or do you think there is something missing from the feel of modern bikes? PS, I had a test ride on a 22 Tuono 1100 factory and I'm gutted to say I had a similar experience. I so wanted to love it as well. Uh, thanks for taking the time to answer all our questions and for your excellent content. Trev, well, thanks, thank you very much. Um, it's interesting. 
Um, I suppose you can divide electronics into two parts really, modern day electronics. There's electronic rider aids, <clears throat> traction control, wheelie control, ABS, blah, blah, blah. And the electronic kind of strides they've taken with mapping. Um, the Ducati, even the old Panigale, has got gear by gear mapping so they can tailor the power to suit the bike in every single gear. Um, but what I would say is that kind of, I agree with you, the M1000R doesn't feel as amazing as it should do. And I think it's a common thread that goes through every 200 brake horsepower or almost 20, uh, 200 brake horsepower bike. 200 horsepower is a lot of power. You know, that figure's banded around quite a lot and you kind of get a little bit blasé. But even riding as much as I do, you get on a 200 horsepower bike and if you're able to open it up fully, it is flipping fast. And 200 horsepower is basically unrideable in the first few gears. And even Grand Prix bikes and World Superbikes don't have that kind of power in the lower gears. So I think what you're feeling with the M1000R is a bike that's kind of quite neutered in order for it to be rideable, neutered at low revs. Um, and yeah, that's what kind of gives it that synthetic feeling. And do you know what? All the super nakeds that make 200 horsepower, none of them are as good. None of them feature as highly in our group tests as the lesser powered ones. Because the less they're restricted, the more natural they feel basically. So I suppose you can have bikes with electronics that still feel natural and it's basically the lower powered bikes. So middleweight nakeds feel fantastic. They still feel quite analog because they haven't got any electronics tugging away at them. So things like the Street Triple RS, amazing, MT09, MT09 SP, brilliant, um, Ducati Monster SP, fantastic, KTM Duke 890, amazing. So yeah, those, those lesser power bikes are always going to feel more analog because they've got fewer electronics tugging at their power strings. And then as for ABS, I completely agree. Even the best ABS systems, there's still something a little bit missing because there's no direct connection between the brake lever and the caliper. It's got to go via an ABS pump and a load of hoses. You're never going to feel as connected as you would do without it. So the European manufacturers do ABS the best. Ducati, BMW, Triumph, Aprilia, and the Japanese are very wooden. So you quite rightly say your 2010 Blade with no ABS probably feels a lot more analog and a lot, a lot nicer feeling. It's a shame really because manufacturers are giving us what we want, you know, more power, more tech. Um, but as they make the bikes cleverer, they kind of take away some of that soul, um, which is always why small bikes are more fun. You know, if, if you've got a group of mates and you're all on 125s or 250s or something small like that, you're always going to have much more of a laugh than if you're all on fire blades. Um, but yeah, interesting question. But yeah, I, I found exactly the same with the M1000R. It left me feeling a bit cold and I actually prefer the S1000R. I think it's much more involving. Great question. Um, next is from Timmy Z Who 9485. Thanks for your question. Um, your videos have brought me to actually riding a, mot a motorcycle after watching it for, for years. I love road trips and also enjoy cleaning my bike, but I can't figure out how you clean and lube your chain without a bike stand on a trip. And do you have any brand or type of bike clean product recommendations? Look forward to your next video. Well, welcome to, uh, welcome to biking. Uh, chains, <clears throat> I'm quite um, anal when it comes to chain maintenance. I try and clean my chain every time I ride it. If you, if you can keep on top of it like that, and the chains become quite easy to, to look after. I know that's not always possible, but I clean my chain with um, GT85, which is a bit like WD40, except nicer smelling. So I clean my chain with that. And you know, if, if I'm gonna go out for a short ride or just a ride in the dry, I probably won't put any lube on it. But if I'm gonna go for a long trip, a bit of a tour, if I know I'm gonna bump into some bad weather, then I'll lube it with, to be honest, anything um it's not very uh, technical is it but you know i think if you clean and maintain your chain very very regularly you don't really need to worry too much about what the lube is i've got no absolute evidence for that 
Um, there's lots of really good chain lube and chain cleaning tests that you can find. Ride Magazine, MCN's done them. John Milbank's done some really good ones on Bennett's. Um, but I've got no actual evidence to, to show that my way is a good way. All that I know is that I very, very rarely need to adjust my chain because it's always in such good condition and it always looks great. I clean my sprockets as well when I clean. Again, I know that's not always possible, but that's how I do it. Um, and if I'm on a big trip and I need to clean the chain, then I can, it's a two man job. One person lifts the bike up on the side stand, so the back wheel's free, and the other one uh, pushes the wheel and cleans the chain. So the way you can do that, stand beside the bike, put your foot right next to the side stand, your right foot next to the side stand, turn the bars fully to the right, and then pull the bike towards you, and then you'll find the rear wheel lifts up. Um, Mike Armitage did a video on that on the MCN YouTube channel during lockdown about how to move your bike around the garage and how to lift it up on the stand. Um, we've never ever broken a stand doing that, 22 years. You always think they'll break, but they never do. Um, so it's a pretty reliable way of doing it, but you need two of you. But if there's only one of you, you just have to do it bit by bit and push the bike along and bit by bit, do it that way. Great question, thanks very much. Next is... Devil's Reject 320. Um, I have a 750 a little over a year. After an eight year break due to ill health, I hope you're okay now. Every time I go out for a few hours, I have a pain in my crutch area from holding uh, the tank in the bends. Do I need to man up or am I doing something wrong? I used to scratch uh, every day with little problems, but with low bars and high pegs, it hurts. If I wait the pegs and hang off, it's better, but on the roads, it's not easy um, or legal to ride like a twat. Well, thanks very much. Well, part of it, I'm afraid, on a sports bike, old age, when you start getting a bit creakier, they do become more uncomfortable to ride, which is why they don't sell anymore. Um, I think naked, sports naked and super naked probably make more sense on the road and sports bikes more sense for sort of more track days. Um, but there's no inherent reason why it should hurt your crutch. So yeah, so maybe you're hanging on too tight with, with both of your legs. Um, the way I hang on on the road, I never hang off on the road, but I do move from side to side. I do do a little bit of body position. So with my top half of my body, I, it's very subtle, but if I'm going through a corner, like the inside of the corner, I have my elbows bent, I have my shoulder down towards the apex, and I move my head past the screen, down towards the mirror, uh, and the bottom half of my body, I just pivot on my bum. So through right-hand corners, I lean on my right sit bone, and on left, on my left sit bone, and I just kind of pivot like that. Um, so there's no big hanging on, it's quite light movements. And the way I grip on with my lower half of my body, I do it all with the opposite leg. So if I'm going through a right-hander, from the bottom of my leg to the top, I dig my heels into the foot plate, into the foot plate, or into the frame of the bike. That's how I kind of grip on. I've kind of got my calves brushing against the frame and I've got my inside thigh on the tank. So that's what's gripping me in, and the whole of my inside of my body, so it's the right side, if I'm going around a right-hander, that's all loose. I'm not hanging on with that leg at all. I'm just doing it with one leg, and then the same if I'm going around a left, I'm hanging on with my right ankle, calf, and thigh. And then if you do that, you can lock yourself into the bike, and you barely need to hold on with anything else. So you can just be a little bit more floppy uh, and it really helps it sort of it helps fatigue it helps you hang on under hard braking as well really and on the track when you are hard braking if you can dig your heels into the heel plates that really really helps rather than hanging on with your hands um but yeah best of luck and i hope you're doing well now next question is from uh k andrew 92 <clears throat> Hey Michael, love your videos. They always help me start my Monday mornings, <laughs> no problem. I've heard you talk at length about things you can change on the bike to make it better in all sorts of ways. Tire suspension, brakes, clip on handlebars, rear sets, etc. 
but how much of a change can you achieve if you have a medical, medial, mediocre parts that can't be replaced? I've heard a few offhand comments about the CBR650R and the CBR600RR and how the RR is vastly superior even if it hasn't been changed for 15 years, mostly due to the parts you can't replace, like the frame. Is it possible to trick out a CBR650R to the level that's almost like an RR, minus the power, or will it never handle that well due to the frame? Thanks. Oh, that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, you know, this kind of is along the lines of why don't they make a comfortable sports bike? And a lot of manufacturers almost do. You know, CBR 650R's case in point, the, the ergonomics of it make loads of sense for the road as a sports bike. It's still great on the track. We've done a lot of tests with the 650 on track and it's actually faster than an, R, than an R7 around the track because it's got more power. Um, but the chassis kind of lets it down a little bit, but it's not so much the frame, to be honest. So the reason the RR is better than the R is because it's got better suspension components, it's got better brakes, and yeah, okay, the frame geometry and the sort of mass centralization is better on the RR, but I think you'd only discover the RR superpowers on the track if you were pushing to the absolute limit. I don't think there's anything wrong with the 650R's frame at all. Um, in fact, because it is a little bit flexier, it makes the bike easy to ride, which, you know, for most of us is what you want. Um, if you're a racer, then you might tie the 650 up in knots, but for track day riders and road riders, I'd actually say the 650 frame is probably better. Um, and then you can put better components on it. You, if you brought um, the components sort of up to the CBR600RR, level so if you had better wouldn't even need better forks just better internals so a cartridge kit in the forks a replacement rear shock um, better tires uh, brake lines pads discs fluid then you would make that cbr 650r really really good really good and yeah you know, the engine has got 90 odd horsepower so it's no slouch um I think that'd be a fantastic bike if you could do that. Um, it's a shame Honda don't do like a CBR 650 RRSP because I think that would be pretty damn good. So yeah, you can definitely bring the 650 up to a very good level despite the fact the frame isn't as good, but it's still a really great bike. So yeah, most bikes have got enough engine for the road and the track but most bikes haven't got enough chassis, which is daft. Because when new bikes come out, everyone talks about the power, everyone kind of forgets the chassis bit. Um, but yeah, the 650's case in point, it's got enough engine, but it definitely hasn't got enough chassis. And if you can change that, you'd make it into a really great bike, like a lot of bikes. Um, but great question, thank you very much. Right, next, next one's from Ernst Queller. Thanks for a great series of videos, really enjoyed watching them. No problem. After getting my bike license in 2009 at the age of 38, which has honestly been one of the best things I've ever done, through riding I've met a fantastic set of friends and together we've ridden locally, toured Europe, gone off-roading in Spain, done the Isle of Man TT, UK and Euro um, track days, and even three days at Phillip Islands with no limits. <laughs> wow, catching up for lost time. At 50, I decided to start racing, so I got my ACU license and signed up with Bemsey. I met you in the paddock in 21 at the Brands GP round, I got a photo. <laughs> I'm now in my third year of racing and I'm totally addicted. This is this year I'm competing in the Bemsey Thunderbike, Ultra and Powerbike classes. Even though I'm at the blunt end of the grids, I really enjoy it, but I'm struggling to get out of the track day road riding mindset, which is hampering my results. Do you have any advice for getting into the racing mindset, i.e. being a bit more ruthless, getting closer to bikes, going for smaller gaps, etc.? Thank you, Paul, 888. Blimey, well, you definitely, you definitely are catching up for lost time, making up for lost time. Um, and you sent this a little while ago, actually, so um, I hope your racing is going well. Um, I think everyone's different on track, the way they approach things. You know, you're either an aggressive close rider or you're not. I don't think being aggressive or close is the key to being better on track. I don't think you need to be a Marquez to, to win races. I mean, I always think about a chap called John Ingram, 
who used to win a lot of the um, Thunder, Thunder Sport GP1 races, which are a good level. I used to kind of hover around the top five in those, top 10 to top five, won a couple. But John Wood is really, really fast, but really safe. Generally, off the start, he would just wait for his tyres to warm up and even get overtake, overtaken, and then he would just gradually pick his way through by not being aggressive. So I think if you've got the speed, the rest of it almost takes care of itself. Okay, if you're battling for the lead, you know, and you're both very equal, you might need to do some aggressive moves. But, you know, I think if you're progressing from the blunt end of the grid, as you say, you're going to move up through the ranks just by being faster. And, you know, that's a whole other thing, how to get faster. You know, it's, it's, it's technique and it's the will to be faster on track. You know, I haven't raced for quite a few years now. And when I go on track, I've, I've kind of lost that hunger to go fast. And when I think back to when I was winning races with, with Thunder Sport and, and Bemsey, <clears throat> not any higher level than that. But even so, I was absolutely addicted to it. I was obsessed with going fast. That's all I would think about. That's all I would train for. That's all I would research. That's all I would do when I was looking at my data. I just wanted to get faster. And I think once you are faster, you know, if you're a, a second faster than the next person, you're going to get past them relatively easy. And if you are that faster, it's just a question of being patient when you're overtaking, not lifting people up, not, you know, making a nuisance of yourself. If you're faster than the person in front, you can normally just hang back a corner or two before you see them or drop back from them, take a run at them and get them down the straights, you know, and, and level them on the brakes. And then you don't have to worry about being too, uh, too crazy. So yeah, but if, if you've got that kind of devil in you and racing does bring out the devil in you as well, obviously, you know, you, you do have to be a little bit ruthless when you're racing and you do have to change mindsets when you're doing track days. You've got to be polite on track days because obviously everyone's there just to have fun. But I think the bottom line is, is as you get faster, you'll naturally gravitate towards the front of the grid and everything else kind of takes care of itself. But great question. Um, finally is from David. Um, David... This is from email, so David Evans. This is from David Evans. So, I'm a new rider and love getting to grips with the world of bikes. Uh, lots of culture, history and techie details to learn about. I'm digging through MCN archives thanks to my local library. Been listening to Oxley Bomb podcast, podcast after it came up on your show and much else. My question is, what else should I be enjoying? Web, print, podcasts, films, any journos that should be on my radar? Please feel free to recommend anything contemporary or vintage, no matter how es esoteric. Tom actually big fan, David. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to the motorcycle fraternity. Wow. I mean, if you're just sort of digging into it now, the world's your oyster. You know, I think it's kind of agreed that the 80s and 90s performance bikes, magazines are kind of up there as the shining beacon of what, fantastic motorcycle journalism and excitement and fun is all about you know some of the writers there matt oxley who's still obviously a MotoGP gp reporter simon hargreaves who's now front end chatter you had mark forsyth rupert paul john robinson all these really clever talented people who could ride um you'd learn a lot from reading those magazines um front end chatter obviously i listen i listen to that 44 teeth Alistair Fagin, Chris Eads, they're really knowledgeable, great riders as well. Um, but what I would say is, let me throw this question out to you lovely viewers. So what recommendations would you have for David? If you leave them in the comments below and hopefully David can find them. Um, yeah, there's, there's loads and loads of stuff out there and stuff I haven't even discovered. I, I discover things along the way as well, but... I would just say absorb as much as you can like a sponge because you can never stop geeking out with motorcycle content. I still do all the time. It's still my hobby as well as my job. So yeah, it's just a, it's, it's a fascinating, interesting, enjoyable journey learning about motorcycles. 
Um, but yeah, good luck with it. So, I think that's enough rambling for today. Thanks very much for watching. Next week, um, we've got a What Makes This Bike Great video coming up. And it's all about the magnificent sounding Honda CVX 1000. So the six cylinder, um, 1979 vintage. If you've never heard one of those bikes, I tell you, it's amazing. Um, and we've got a lovely little soundtrack on the video. So stay tuned for that. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and we will see you again.